You may be seated this morning. Uh, it is an honor to see you today, to be here at Real Life Church. A couple things that I want to reiterate before we get into the rest of the service. First of all, welcome to Real Life starting up in June. Don't forget that. Get signed up so you can get plugged in. You can see more about who we are and what we are as a church. Everybody say June 30th. Next Sunday night, 6 p.m., we're going to do some baptisms, but we're doing them out at Cotter Spring. All right, so we always have a great time out there. I promise if you get baptized in Cotter Spring, you do not forget getting baptized in Cotter Spring because it's a bit chilly, all right? But we've got already a great list. I think last week I heard the number was up to about 17 people that we're going to baptize out there. But if you feel like, if you feel like this is God's next step for you, you're ready to go public with your faith. You've, you've made that decision to follow Jesus, but you've not taken the step of going public with your faith, which is what baptism is. It's an, it's an outward expression of an inward decision. Then I should challenge you to do that. Get signed up. Stop at the Connect counter right out here after service. Make sure you let them know, hey, so that way we can have somebody contact you. Here's what we don't want. We don't want anybody just getting wet. We want you to understand what it is. We want you to know what it is. We want you to know the process and make sure we're walking where we need to be walking. God's special day for us here. Uh, a few years ago, Jennifer and I, I believe I just, uh, they, they clarified with me, it was 2019, Jennifer and I got to go to a, a minister's meeting in Memphis, Tennessee, and there was a new couple there, and that new couple was Nick and Lisa Smith. And Nick and Lisa Smith immediately became close friends to us. How, 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 many, how many of you have ever seen the movie Step Brothers? Hands up. Sinners. Gotcha. You didn't know what I was doing. You need to repent right now, right here. Can you pl play something slow, Dallas? We're going to have, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but Nick and I, we just connected immediately. And it was as if this moment, we just looked at each other and was like, hey, did we just become best friends? Because our sense of humor is similar. It's really dangerous when our wives get together. We, we just have a great, how many of you have great people like that in your life where they just it just clicks? And, and that's what happened with, with our family and their family. And uh, Pastor Nick and his family are in this week. I asked him, I said, hey, it's summertime. I'd love you to come preach at Real Life Church. He came last year and spoke to us and did such a great great job, and he's got a powerful word today. I promise you, you will need some of the information that he has for you today. So would you guys do me a favor? Would you do me the honor and help me honor Nick Smith as he comes this morning and preaches the word to us? Uh, if you've seen the movie Step Brother, you just had a good life, all right? That's all I'm going to say. No altar call needed at all. How's everybody doing today? Good, man. My name is Nick. I'm, I'm a pastor in Glasgow, Kentucky, and I really am honored to be here. Uh, pastor Vince talked about it. We, we, did be, we became fast friends, and I want you to know uh, you should be so grateful he is your pastor, your leader, because he, he not only pastors you, but he pastors with a small group of us, and he has poured into me in such a mighty, mighty way. And so it really is a privilege and honor to be here. And when he asked me to come out and speak, I asked him, I said, hey, what are you doing? Uh, is there something you want me to talk about? And he's like, you talk about whatever you want, which that's dangerous when you talk to that, say that to me. So I decided what I want to talk about today is love, sex, and dating. And, and I call it LSD, the drug of choice, because the reality is every single person in our culture, we're getting high off of this concept of love, sex, and dating. And where I want to go today, just to kind of all cars on the table, is this. That if you don't know how you fell in love, which the bottom line is you probably don't. Probably, nobody's probably ever talked to you about what I'm going to talk about today. If you don't know how you fall in love, it becomes really, really hard to stay in love. Which is why I think we have divorce rates the way that they are. It's why we have relationships the way that they are. It's why if you're younger, maybe you're pushing off marriage farther and longer because we've lost the concept of love. We've lost the trust that we had in love. And what's happened is it's become this kind of secondary thing that if it feels right, if it feels good, then we'll do it. And if it doesn't, we'll just move on. And I want you to know there's a better way. There's a different way. And so today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through the biochemical aspects of what happens every single time, whether you believe in God. In fact, if you're here today and you don't believe in God, so glad you're here. Maybe you're watching online and you're just checking this place out. This is the message for you because the first three-fourths of the message, you don't, you don't have to believe in God at all. It just is. 
And the end of it, just so you know where we're going, we're going to unpack a passage that hopefully you're familiar with. And if you're not, that's okay. But hopefully you're going to see it in a very, very different light. And so as we talk about what happens when you fall in love, there's really kind of three critical areas. Number one is drugs. When you find somebody that you like, when you find that person, you're like, oh, you feel it, right? You are, your drugs go off in your brain. And in fact, there are three specific drugs that you need to know. Because if you don't know how you fall in love, it's going to be really hard to stay in love. And it's dopamine, endorphins, and oxytocin. Dopamine is the big drug in the culture right now. It's the driver drug. Dopamine is what gets you to the place where you want to know what's next, what's new. If you've ever scrolled for one, two, skip a few, 13, 14 hours on your phone. Anybody ever do that really quickly, right? Yeah, this, five. Okay, the rest of you are liars. Okay, that's great. Okay, good. No, we do need an altar call, Vince. That's great. Yeah. Um, now, if you've ever done that and you've ever looked back and like, why do I keep scrolling? I don't even know what's next. It's dopamine. Dopamine wants you to figure out what's next and it'll push you to go over and over and over and over again. That is incredibly important when it comes to relationships because dopamine goes off when a relationship is new. It's the driver drug. It's what's next. And so in a relationship, guess what? Everything that you do is new. If you've ever thought about it, maybe you've, you haven't thought about it this way, but you think about when you were younger, that first time you were about to hold a girl or a guy's hand. You remember that moment? It's anticipation. You're kind of like, oh, oh, I think our pinky fingers are touching, you know? Like, oh, you know, like, oh, like you feel it. Like that is dopamine. It is powerful. It is a great drug. It is awesome. If I could get high on it all the time, I would. Okay. It is a great drug. But isn't it true also that you had that like, oh, and then eight months into your marriage or into your relationship, your wife or your spouse tries to hold your hand. You're like, leave me alone. Stop touching me. You know, you just move on. Right. Because it's no longer new. And here's the kicker. And this is why this is really, really important. That drug lasts about four to eight months. That when you find somebody new, doesn't matter who it is, doesn't matter whether you believe in God or not, that drug, dopamine, will last four to eight months because there's only so many new things you have in a relationship. That's the first one. The second one is this. It's endorphins. Endorphins is the pain drug. It's the drug that goes off when, when you have a headache and you're trying to fix something. It's a drug that goes off when something goes wrong in a relationship. And so again, what happens and what it looks like when it comes to relationships is if you've ever broke up with somebody and you're in pain, whether it was their fault or your fault, it doesn't really matter. You feel lonely, you feel bad about yourself and you go out and you're not necessarily looking for Mr. Right, you're just looking for Mr. Right now. It's endorphins. That's why in high school, kids go from relationship to relationship to relationship to relationship to relationship because it lasts in high school about four to eight months and they're getting high off of each other. When they break up with somebody, it feels really, really bad. And the way you feel really, really bad and you get better is you find somebody else and it kicks off endorphins and it kicks. And some people, whether they're 18 or I've even known some that are 88, they go from relationship to relationship to relationship, not understanding how they fall in love, not understanding the chemical cocktail that is going off in their brain with endorphins, repeating the same cycle always looking, never finding, which leads to oxytocin. It is the best one of the three. It is the most powerful one of the three. It is called the cuddle drug, and it goes off in two very distinct places. It goes off when you have sex with somebody. It, it pair bonds you with that person. Whatever you're looking at has huge implications for so many other things. But it also goes off when you have a baby. And so, again, if you're here today and you've had a child, you, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. I have, a five, I have five kids because I like my wife. And, and so we have five kids. Some of you got that. Anyway, the rest of you get on the way home. Like, oh, wait a minute. Um, <laughs> it's third service. So anyway, all right, so here we go. I don't know how it goes here in my church. Third service, a little bit loose. So anyway, um, I feel like you guys get it. All right, yeah. So, so uh, five kids, I got to go back. Yeah, here we go. Five kids. Okay, here's the deal. Here's what happens. If you have a child, you've walked through this. People say the dumbest thing about childbirth. They say, they say this, oh, it's such a beautiful process. <laughs> no, it's not. It's nasty. It's dirty. There's blood. There's guts. There's other stuff. It is gross. There's screaming. There's yelling. There's scissors. It is a terrible process. No one in their right mind looks at a birth and says, that's just beautiful. That's just amazing. Like no one does that. I'm traumatized and I didn't even walk through it. 
But here's what happens if you've had a baby, you know what I'm talking about. The baby comes out, they clean it up because of all the blood and guts and all the other garbage. They clean it up, they put it on that mother's chest. She takes a deep breath. And then she'll say the most peculiar thing. It's worth it. And all the dudes are like, are you sure? Because <laughs> part of you is still on the floor. They haven't put it back in yet. Like There's a part like, are you sure? Like, it's bad. But oxytocin is going off. It is going off in a massive way. And here is what oxytocin does. We're going to unpack this in a few moments. Oxytocin is so powerful. It has the power to rewrite memories. It has the power to make you think a bad experience was actually a great experience. It has the power to make you think that a great experience was actually a bad experience. Oxytocin is one of the most powerful things, and it goes off two times. When you have sex and you're intimate with somebody, and when you have a baby. That is just the first thing that happens. And if that was enough, man, that would be, that'd be awesome. There are two more things that happen. It's not just drugs. It's hormones that go off. And maybe not in the way that you think. See, when you find somebody else that you like, there's all that chemical cocktail goes off. All the drugs go off, but also your hormones invert. And so if you're a dude, your estrogen level goes through the roof. And so ladies, if you ever met a man and you're like, oh my goodness, I found the best guy. He just talks, 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 talks. We talk at night. We talk during the day. He text messages me and he text messages me more than K. My old boyfriend just used to say K. He gives me a whole like, hey, I was thinking about you this morning. He talk, 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 talk. He is the perfect guy. No, he's high. <laughs> he's a big girl. That's it. That's all he is. He's a big girl. Like his estrogen's through the roof. He has no clue what he's doing. When I was dating my wife, she's the only woman I ever dated. I wrote a poem. Do you know how many poems I've ever written? One. That's it. <laughs> Do you know why? I was high. Now I'm not. And listen, here's the deal. If you don't know how you fall in love, if you don't understand this, if no one ever teaches you this, what happens is you find somebody, you click, the chemicals go off, the estrogen goes up, you talk, 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 and you start to believe wrongly. Oh, I think he might be the one. Mm, no, that's not it. But ladies, you're not off the hook. You're not off the hook at all. In fact, in fact, the opposite happens with you. Your estrogen doesn't go up. Your testosterone goes through the roof. It will be higher in the first four to eight months in your relationship than it will ever be in the rest of your relationship, which means practically what this looks like is all of a sudden, guys, you're going to be dating a girl and she is going to be so aggressive. She's going to look at you. You are the prey. You are, she is the hunter. She will get you. That is exactly what's going to happen. And she will be, and here's the, here's the reality, she will be sexually aggressive in a way that she probably never will be for the rest of the relationship. And so what happens is this, you're going to sit back as a dude and you're going to think, man, I'm the man. No, you're not. <laughs> She's just a big dude. That's it. Like right there. And let me just explain some of your relationships. Again, this is, I was never taught this. This is why I love to do this message. Here's the deal. Some of you, you, d you dated, and here's what happened. You talked a lot and had sex a lot, and you talked a lot and had sex a lot, and you talked a lot and had sex a lot, and you had a great relationship, and you thought they were the one, and then four to eight months into the relationship, all of a sudden, you quit talking as much. You quit having sex as much. You quit talking as much, quit having sex as much, and then you start to get in arguments. Like, hey, you changed. What do you mean you changed? I, you changed. I didn't change. You changed. We used to have sex more. Well, we used to talk more. We used to talk more. It's because we used to have sex more. And here's the deal. Neither one of you changed. You just both, back went, both went back into who you really are. And again, if you don't understand the biochemical aspects of what happens when you find somebody else, and it is irrelevant who it is, it, it just is, you will, you will find yourself in positions and in relationships that you never thought. You will cross lines. You will cross boundaries that you never intended to cross, all because you didn't realize that your feelings will always almost fail you. That's the second one. There's one more. It's your heart rate. And again, this is, just, this is just biochemistry. This is just kind of what happens. But they've done studies and they've realized that when your heart rate goes above 120 beats a minute, your cognitive ability goes through the floor, meaning you can't think when you get excited. And so if you've ever watched a football game, do you guys have football here? Just kidding. I know you do. They're just not any good. So anyway, so <laughs> Vince will be back next week. So anyway, uh, uh, 
If you've ever watched a football game, here's what's happening right now. In practice, that football player, that quarterback, man, he has thrown every pass perfectly. He is nailing it. Do you know why? He is calm. He is cool. He's got a red jersey on. No one can hit him. He's like, man, this is easy. But you get in a game. It's fourth quarter. Game's on the line. It's 80,000 fans or 20,000 if you're in Arkansas. So anyway, just, uh, just kidding. Crowd's going nuts. There's two linebackers, 260 pounds coming right at him, and his heart rate goes up because he is nervous and he doesn't want to blow it. And what does he do? He steps back perfectly. I've seen it a hundred times. And he throws the most beautiful pass to the other team. And everybody watching on TV or in the stands says the exact same thing. What was he thinking? He wasn't. He couldn't. It's why in the sports world, there's a few people that they call it, they got the it factor. Because when it matters. They don't get nervous. Their heart rate doesn't go up and they stay cool. That has huge implications for your relationships though, because this explains, it does not excuse, but it explains some of the biggest regrets in this room right now. It explains maybe why you struggle coming back to church because you did something, you crossed a line that you thought there's no way I can come back to it because here's what happened. Let me just tell you your story. You had some boundaries that you were not going to cross. And you were never to cross. Maybe, maybe they're moral boundaries. Maybe they're personal boundaries. Whatever it is, in 8 o'clock in the morning, that fateful weekend that you can look back and go, yeah, I still can't believe I did that. I went across the line. At 8 o'clock in the morning, you weren't going to cross it. And that's true. 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you weren't going to cross it. That's true. But 6 o'clock came. And you went out with him or her. And, man, they look kind of good. They smell kind of good. And you start to get a little bit excited. Dopamine started to kick in. You start feeling yourself a little bit. And she's a little aggressive. And he's a little talkative. And this just feels like love. And you get more excited. And the night progresses. And again, you told yourself you're never going to cross the line. You're never going to go there. But here is the deal. And I'm just going to be as vague as I can be. There is a lot in between. Hi, how you doing? And let's get it on. You know what I'm saying? And your heart rate went up. And your cognitive ability went through the floor. You cross the line you never thought you would cross with them. You wake up the next morning and you say to yourself, what was I thinking? You couldn't. You wouldn't. And again, it doesn't excuse the behavior. I'm not trying to make excuses for anybody in here right now. I'm just trying to explain it because here's the deal. If you don't understand how you fall in love, it will be really, really hard for you to stay in love. And there are mistakes in this room that have been made. There are boundaries that have been crossed. There are things that have been happened or happened to you that you never thought possible because you didn't understand drugs, hormones, and heart rate. And so with that said, I want to give you kind of three things. Three kind of implications in light of all of this, uh, that, that if this is true, and I believe it's true, and you can look it all up, it's all scientifically backed. If this is true, what does this mean for us? Number one, it means this, that listen, here's the deal. Being in love isn't bad, it just makes you blind. You need, some of you need to hear that. You're, you're dating, maybe you're, you're younger, you're in high school, or maybe you're in college or whatever, and here's the deal. You just need to hear this. Being in love, it doesn't make, it's not bad. It's a gift. It's awesome. It's wonderful. I wish I could feel that. That is incredible. Don't show it off in front of us. Make some of us want to gag, but like, it's awesome. It just makes you blind. You're high as a kite. You do not see it, which is why some of you, again, you look back at some of the weirdos that you used to date and you think to yourself, what did I see in them? Well, you saw exactly what you wanted. No more, no less, because you were in love and you were blind you just need to own that. It's not bad. It's a wonderful, wonderful gift. I put in my notes here, we miss their flaws because of our feelings. And so what happens is we have all these feelings and, and we think our feelings are faithful when it's really the other way around that we're called to be faithful and our feelings will follow it. And so we have all these feelings and we miss all the flaws in them. It's the story of the girl who is 18 and she brings home her boyfriend and he's 46 years old and he's got tattoos all and he's got a rap sheet and she's going, oh, I think he's amazing. And mom and dad are going, um, can we talk to you? I don't think you're seeing this clearly. And then she'll say this. And if you ever hear yourself say this, you just need to pause. Oh, you don't know him the way that I do. I know his past 47 girlfriends have all bad him, but he's changed. <laughs> no, he's high. And it'll last four months. And he'll go back to who he was. 
If you find yourself saying to yourself, listen, you don't know him the way that we know him, that is incredibly true. But the bottom line is this, you don't see him the way that we see him though. You can't see him. You may know him better, but you don't see him. You don't see her. But like, dude, she's hot. Yeah, so's hell. Be careful, okay? It's just, <laughs> the bottom line is, I put it here, if you can't see what the people who love you the most and the people who've been with you the longest see, then you're blind, not them. If you're dating somebody right now and you can't, you got some people, you got some pastors, some small group leaders, You've got some, some friends who've been with you. You've got some parents and they're kind of warning you and they're kind of cautioning you like, oh, just what about? It? If you can't see what they see, you're blind, not them. And I know you're feeling a certain way. Listen, your feelings absolutely will fail you. They absolutely will. You're blind. It's not bad. It's okay. Own it. Embrace it. It's a great gift. It's just not going to last. And too often we make mistakes in that four to eight month period. We make decisions based on feelings and not facts, and we end up regretting it. That's the first one. Number two is this. You just need to understand when you find somebody new, they're new, not special. I'm going to ruffle some feathers here right now. Um, listen, uh, and I mean this in the best possible way. We, we live in a world right now with the Disney culture that is like, oh, my gosh, you got to find the one. If you find the right one, you'll live happily ever after. Have you ever noticed they never show what the happily ever ever looks like? They're like, wedding day, yay, honeymoon, yay. Pfft, movie's over. Yeah, they missed the hardest part. If you've been married more than 15 minutes, you're like, that is not happily ever after. That does not happen. It's like, I used to like how he chewed cereal. Now I want to smack him. It's ridiculous. For some of you, that was very personal. You're like, oh, go here. No, it's true. Here's the deal. But here's the deal. If you believe in the myth, if you believe in the whole, man, I got to find the one and I got to find it's destiny or whatever. Here's the deal. You will spend your life looking for the one and the one will make you feel a certain way. And so what I deal with as a pastor all the time, I literally do, I do this sermon every single year, same content, same thing every single year. Do you know why? Because every single year I'll preach this to couples who are in a great marriage. When I preach this, they forget this. And then they find somebody new. And the same people that have heard this sermon 14 different times will look at me and go, but Nick, you don't understand. No. It's different. They're special. He listens to me. He's high. She wants to be with me. My wife doesn't want to be with me. She's high. But if you don't understand how you fall in love, I'll tell you exactly. It happens all the time. You get married or you're in a relationship, you're dating somebody for several years and the feelings go away. And I get that whole, the chemicals go away. They only last four to eight months. You get there, you get in a routine and, and real, I would argue real love shows up, but then you go to the office or you go to work or you go to the gym or you go to some, unfortunately, sometimes church and you see him or her and you're like, ooh, okay, ooh. And they're kind of hot and they're kind of attractive. And all of a sudden you start to go someplace and you start to fall in love and the chemicals go off and you don't understand it's just a chemical reaction. You don't understand how love works. And you start to believe, oh, they're not new. They're special. Remember I told you oxytocin has the power to rewrite memories. That's what goes off. It goes off and all of a sudden, and I've heard it. Maybe you've heard people say this. Maybe you've said this. I've never loved anybody the way that I love this person. It's not true. It's oxytocin. And the same drug that can tell a woman, it wasn't that bad, <laughs> can tell a man or a woman, no, they're special. And they believe it. And they run right into it. And they mess things up. The bottom line is, I say this to my church, your, your spouse is not one in a million, they're one of a million. And that's not what we want to hear because we like to believe we're special. We like to believe we're destiny. We like to believe, oh my gosh, God knit us together and he perfectly made me for you. Is that why you guys fight all the time? Because you're perfectly together? <laughs> that's, that's a myth made up by Disney or somebody else. Here, here's the bottom line. If you, want to, if you want a tagline, marriages that work, work. Do you want to know what marriages work? The ones that work. 
This is why I believe arranged marriages have a much higher success rate than, than regular marriages in our Western mindset, where it's like in our West, it's like you got to find the one, and we spend a lot of time looking for the one, and how's your personality, and are we compatible, and do I feel it, and do we have the chemistry, and all of these other things. We have all these standards, and here's the deal. We walk into a marriage based on our feelings and hoping that somehow we'll be faithful, but arranged marriages, you get two people, and they just kind of walk up at the altar, sometimes seeing each other for the first time, it's like, oh, Gross. Okay. Uh, we've got some work to do. Because I didn't pick you. And you didn't pick me. We've got to figure this out. And they put in the work too often. We want our feelings to carry us. Which leads to the last one, which is number three. Attraction is choice. But attraction is chance. What I mean by that is this. Who you're attracted to is is random. It's chance. Who you're attracted to is chance. It, it, it's this random thing. And, and the bottom line is you don't, you don't pick this. In fact, you did not, when you were born, you didn't sit down and go, listen, I would like to be attracted to shorter people over taller people. I would like brunettes over redheads. I would like smart over dumb. Like you didn't do that. You have no control who you're attracted to. And yet here's the deal. If you walk down the street, be like, she's hot, she's hot, she's hot. You're going to get smacked. Okay. By the way, don't do that. Just so we're clear. Right. But you have no control over that. And that does not change when you get married. There's no like, I do. And now, I'm, no, listen, you, who you're attracted to is random. It's chance. But the traction that that person has in your life is completely 100% a choice. And our culture flips it. See, we get mad if our spouse would be attracted to somebody else. But then we say really weird things about love. We say things like, you know what? The heart wants what the heart wants. Can't control who you love. You absolutely control who you love. See, the first time you met him or her, the first time you saw that person, wasn't worth half your paycheck. Wasn't worth your reputation. Wasn't worth your job. Wasn't worth your weekends with your kids. It wasn't worth anything. It's just kind of like, man, they're kind of hot. But then you spend some time with them. And you pursued it. Oh, just intellectually at first. But because you told yourself, oh, I'll never cross that line. I'll never go there. You did everything that we talked about with the heart rate and everything in the very beginning, you told yourself all these lies because you didn't understand how love works. And so you end up in this place where you cross a line and you cross a boundary that you never intended to cross. And you wake up one day, I've done the counts and I've done it multiple times. And you'll look at me, you'll look at Vince, you'll look at somebody else, your best friend and go, can't control who you love. I don't love my spouse anymore, but I think I love this person. They're this and this and this and this and this. And if I could just be with them, then I'd be happier. There is no bigger lie from the pit of hell. It's not true. Who you're attracted to is chance. It's random. How much traction they have in your life is a choice, which leads to this statement. And this is going to be a hard statement. It's a hard statement that I, that I talk about. And again, there's going to be exceptions to it. But at the end of the day, here's the deal. If you're here today and you're married and you do not feel in love with your spouse, you do not have those feelings of love, it speaks way more to what you haven't done than what they have. Because again, I do the counseling and I sit down with the couples and I go, what's wrong? And both of them, I've yet to see the couple go, you know what, Nick, it's 100% my fault. I've yet to see that. It's kind of like, yeah, well, let me tell you, we used to, and we never, and she always, and he always, and he never, and da-da-da-da-da. It's always their fault. It's always their thing. But here's the deal. If you want a tagline, feelings follow faithfulness every time. Every single time, your feelings will follow it. The reason that you fell in love with the current, current person you're with is because when the chemicals were going off, you did some stuff. When the chemicals were going off, every time you got in a fight because you were excited and you were happy and you were high as a guy, you just forgave him. Every time he annoyed you, you just forgave him. You served them. You loved them. You spoke life into them. You sent them long text messages. You did so many things. And here's the deal. Feelings follow faithfulness. And you weren't in love. You were in lust in the beginning. But one day, isn't it true? If you're married, you woke up one day and it wasn't like a decision. And you just said, you know, I... I can love them. It's because feelings follow faithfulness. Whether you realize it or not, whether you wanted to or not, you faithfully serve them, which the opposite is true, though, too. See, again, if you're here today and you don't have feelings of love towards your spouse, it speaks much more to what you haven't done than what they have done. Because for many couples, what happens is we treat our marriages like a covenant, not a con like a contract, not a covenant. 
And so it's kind of like, well, if you're going to quit doing this, then I'm going to quit doing this. Well, if you're going to quit doing this, I'm going to quit doing this. If you're going to quit doing this, I'm going to quit doing this. And it just kind of boils down to the lowest common denominator. You wake up one day and go, I don't I love them anymore. Well, of course you don't. Because you quit being faithful to them. And so what happens is we mess it up. Feelings follow faithfulness. And so the bottom line is this. I just want to start to wrap it up. We could be done right now. It'd be a good TED Talk. You know, we haven't used the Bible. We haven't talked about God. And again, here's the deal. This is why I love this message. You can be an atheist and hopefully get something out of this, hopefully understand this. But if you were God and you knew all this, you knew people were going to misunderstand lust and love. You knew that they were going to confuse the two. You knew it was going to be messed up. You could look ahead and go, oh my goodness, they're going to kind of just mess this whole thing up. What would you say about love? What would you say thousands of years ago so that we would still, to this day, be able to look at it and go, no, 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 I know I'm tempted to think that lie. That's not true. What is love? What would you say? We, we know. There's a guy, author, who wrote a big chunk of the New Testament named Paul. And he wrote this small section, and the irony is this. Some of you today, you're in a broken marriage right now, and you probably had this read at your wedding. And he tells us exactly what love is. He says it this way, 1 Corinthians 13, 4, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. There's nothing in there about feelings. There's nothing in there about emotions. There's nothing in there about the things that we want. Like, oh my gosh, no, I think they're the one. I think it's destiny. Oh, I've got to find them. No, 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 you don't understand. Love, love, is, love is what we do. It's not how we feel because feelings always, I'm telling you right now, feelings always follow faithfulness, always. And you can't spend 10 years pursuing one direction and 10 minutes the other and expect them to feel that way. No, it may take some time, but I'm telling you right now, you love somebody, physically love somebody, serve them, love them, live this out. Your feelings will follow it. He goes on, he goes, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Some of you need to hear that last part. Let me just, I'm gonna say it again really quickly because this, I, I do a lot of counseling. It keeps no record of wrongs. I know couples, they've got a list. Like literally, they're like, here it is right now. I bring it to church every week just in case. Like you just, they got a list. And for many of them, it's not physical, it's mental though, because you can sit back and when you get in an argument, you start to whip it out. You're like, listen, I know you did this at this date and this and this and this and this. And every time you start to lose an argument, do you know what you do? You don't want to lose the argument. So you just whip out, well, at least I didn't do, boom, and you slam that thing on the table. At least I didn't do that. (laughs) Let me just tell you, you win the argument and lose your marriage. You can be right and wrong at the same time. You need to get it right, not be right. And too often when we're fighting, we just keep this record of wrong. Paul writes, he says, you want to love your spouse? Just throw it away. Just throw away the list. Mentally, physically, quit quit bringing it up. Some of you, you need to walk out of here and never bring that thing up again. He goes on though. He says, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It, and this is my favorite line of it, it always protects. Always, that, that's powerful. Let me just ask you guys, here's the deal. Listen, guys, listen, I need, if you're married, are you protecting your marriage actively? Are you protecting your wife's heart? Are you speaking life into her? I know so many women that they would just love a, a, a real text message, not K. But they would love a message, hey, woke up early thinking about you. You're so beautiful, blah, blah, blah. They would love post-it notes on the mirror. Are you speaking into her? Do you know her love language? Are you spending time? Are you protecting? Too often, men, we just sit back and go, no, I used to do that kind of stuff like that, and we're fine. And I've had multiple men in my office, broken marriage going, I had no clue. It's because you forgot that we have a very real enemy who is roaring, looking to devour all of our marriages, all that is good, all that is pure. And you forgot that you were called to actively, intentionally protect your marriage. Ladies, are you protecting your marriage? Are you engaging? Because here's the deal, and I said it kind of silly in the beginning, but it's such a big deal when it comes to sex. 
Sex is a huge thing. Listen, guys, you should speak life into your wife. Ladies, you should have sex with your husband. It should be regular. It should be often. It should be a way that you view I'm protecting my marriage. In fact, in this passage, a little bit earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul says this powerful statement. He says, never quit having sex. We're like, that's not in there. And some of the others are like, that's my life verse. Yeah, I love that one. You know, He says, never quit having sex, except perhaps to pray so that you do not give Satan a foothold. And there's some women in here and some men too, because it goes both ways. You treat sex like a weapon. You treat sex like an option instead of a protection. He goes, it always trusts. But they lied, but they cheated. It always hopes and it always perseveres. See, if I can leave you with anything, it's this. Your marriage is a ministry. Maybe you never thought about it like that. But in a world that is very confused about marriage and relationships and love and sex and dynamics and all of that kind of stuff like that, your marriage is a ministry. In fact, how you handle your marriage may speak louder to those around you than anything you ever actually say. And so when you walk through hard times, that's why we need to persevere. When you forgive, that's why we need to let go of the the, the list that we got going on. When you start to trust again, even though they failed, that's why he says, always trust no matter what. When you protect and you're going forward and it's different and all the other guys are going, what are you doing? Oh, no, I'm doing this. That's kind of weird. Yeah, I know. Your ministry, your ministry is your marriage. And so what God says is this, here's the deal. Your marriage may proclaim the gospel better than anything you ever say. The fact that you stay, the fact that you Love them, not in the ooey gooey, oh my goodness, I feel so amazing towards you. No, that goes away. You have four to eight months with that. But the fact that you always protect, you always trust, you always persevere in the midst of hardship, in the midst of pain, in the midst of betrayal, that speaks volumes. That is the gospel. So as we kind of wrap it up here today, here's what I want to say. If you're married, and you're tempted to leave, I want to encourage you to change your pattern, not your partner. Change your pattern, it's not your partner. Here, here's the bottom line. It's, it's so easy to sit back and say, I, have, I just need a new partner. I just got to find a one. Don't change your partner. Change your pattern. Go home. Maybe memorize this. Love this. Learn this. Live this out. Change your pattern, not your partner. And over time, not immediately, your feelings will follow your faithfulness. If you're dating somebody, I would just encourage you to invite two or three people into your life and say, hey, listen, I'm in love. I might be blind. What do you see that I don't see? And then listen to them. Don't get defensive. Don't start going, oh, you just don't know. Like, just listen, it may save you the biggest mistake you'll ever make. And if you're single, it's a gift. It's a gift. I'm telling you, it's a gift. It may not feel like a gift. It's a gift. Set up extreme boundaries in your relationships. Because now that you know how love happens, now that you see how it can go off the rails really, really easy, now that you can see that, man, it's not bad, you're just blind. Listen, you have the opportunity to save yourself from making some of the biggest mistakes you've ever made. You have the opportunity to protect yourself from extreme regret. I want to encourage you to walk out of here and sit back and go, no, I'm going to set up some extreme boundaries so that when I get excited, when I cross the line, I cross this line, not this line. And I'm still honoring God with my life. See, the reason I can say all this is because of verse eight. Verse eight is three letters, three words. It's this, love never fails. I love that. It's beautiful. It's what gives me the authority. It's why I talk about this because here's the deal. In this room right now, there are hundreds of different situations watching online. There's all these exceptions, Nick, but what about and what about and what if? I get it. I hear, I've heard so many of them. Here's the deal. Here's what I know. Love never fails. It does. And if you do it, feelings follow faithfulness. If you love them, it will come back wherever you're at. I know there's some marriages that you're cold right now. You're kind of apathetic right now that you're like, oh, I'm too old. You don't understand that that season's past. No, love doesn't fail. Love is perfect. Love is all of those things. And what happens is the enemy will tell us, you messed it up, you messed it up. And so I love doing this. 
You can replace the word love with God. Because God is love. So the last thing I want you to hear today is this. God never fails. You might have. You might, you might be sitting here going, it's too late for me. I've already crossed too many boundaries. I've already done too many things. I've already messed up my marriage. Nick, you don't understand. I, I've got a pornography addiction. I cheated. There's, there's another person. I'm, I'm too far gone. No, you're not. Not because you're awesome, because he's awesome. Not because you got it figured out, but because he's got it figured out, because God never fails. And if you're here today or you're watching online and you're hearing this, it's because God's not done with you. Because God's got a plan with you. He's speaking to you through this passage today, letting you know, I got you. You are my child, made in my image, who I love, who I am for, who I am working all things out, even the things that you meant negatively for your good. I got you. I will not fail you today. So as you leave today, I hope you go in the confidence. Love wins. God wins. And he never fails. Let me pray for you. God, thank you so much for grace, for mercy, for your word that guides us. Thank you for every marriage and relationship in here. I pray for the singles right now that you would protect their hearts and minds, that you would help them have strong boundaries. I pray that you would, you would be with those dating, that you would help them see as much as they can and help them not make the mistakes to walk faithfully with you. And God, I pray for those who are married right now, whether they're good or bad, that they would understand the power of real love, the power of service. And they would go home and love their spouse, regardless of how they feel. They would be faithful and trust that their feelings will follow. God, we love you. We thank you so much. Amen. Thank you.